good afternoon. Welcome to the table where we sit down with a number of really interesting people from different walks of life. Today's guest is Taylor Nichols, an accomplished actor. He's in Pen15, Perry Mason, and 1BR right now. Uh, if you're not familiar with 1BR, it's uh, a sleeper horror film that uh, is catching fire. And uh, if the technology cooperates properly, I'm going to let Taylor in on the conversation. And uh, Taylor, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob, how you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, thanks for joining me on the show today. I, uh, I gave the audience a quick overview uh, of what you're doing right now. And uh, you know what might be good is if you gave uh, background in terms of how you got into acting and uh and we can take it from there great um <laughs> you know there's an old saying in in entertainment and acting you know uh if you can do anything else do it <laughs> and my problem was i couldn't do anything else so i i did this i i started in high school you know like a lot of people and uh i went to the university of michigan for for college and um, I started off studying business and economics, and I, I just couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't do it. I, I, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of my colleague students said to me, um, you know, this is being from Michigan, you're going to be a great middle manager in a car company. Oh my and God. I just thought, oh my Something God. Something you're really aspiring to, right? Right. So um, by the end of college, I was pretty much just doing, are you drinking a beer? I am drinking a beer, and uh, I'm, I'm drinking, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but it's a Schopperhofer. And I, ironically enough, I discovered it in a German restaurant in Mexico City last year. Wow. So cheers. You know, shouldn't cheers you have sent me a beer so I can have a beer with you? Well, you know, shame on me. Uh, <laughs> but, but I will give you full license to go get a beer or some other uh, liquid comestible, if you like. Yeah. Except that it's 10 in the morning. Yeah, but right, right now, right now it's six thirty in London. I, I would go on that uh, time zone. Perfect, perfect. So just to finish your your question, Bob, I, I uh, uh, by the end of my time in college, um, I was doing nothing but taking theater courses and you know doing plays and studying theater, and just started working right after that. I. I, I you know, worked in Michigan a little bit. Then I went out to Aspen, Colorado and worked in the theater. Then I moved to New York City and, you know, worked, you know, downtown and off, off Broadway and then off Broadway. And then I started doing national tours of shows and little by little, I've been able to cobble together a career. You know, it strikes me that New York, if you're going to be an actor, has to be one of the toughest environments. It feels to me like there's a lot of altruistic people that go to New York, you know, clearly it's one of the two destinations in the United States, right? But <clears throat> making, making a living in New York uh, in the theater feels to me like it's, it's tougher than making a living in LA. Yeah, it is. Everything's tougher in New York. Um, and very few people make a living in the theater. I mean, I, I waited tables, I worked at a bike, bike store, um, all, all kinds of um, different things. But, you know, you, you and I are actually from the same hometown. And yeah. Irvin Johnson, Magic Johnson, the basketball player, is from our hometown. And um, he had a great quote that someone asked him why he didn't get married when he was still playing basketball. And he said, married? Man, I'm married to basketball. And that's how life was for me in New York in those early years. I was married to basketball. I mean, I was married to theater, you know, I mean, uh, I was going to say, I thought you were an actor. Yeah. And that's, that's all we did. I mean, my, my sure. life surrounded by, you know, who I hung out with and, and the things I did. And that's all I did. And New York's actually a really wonderful place to do that. There are so many other people that were doing the same thing. Um, so that as, as difficult as it was, there was a real camaraderie of, like-minded individuals all striving for the same goal. And I, I'm and sure, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry there's no, let me, let me Yeah, go, go for it. Well, I was just gonna say one more thing. And that, and that goal was to work, not to be a star. And I think a lot of the people that come out to LA when they start, 
come out to be like a, a TV star or something. And not that everyone doesn't want to do that because everyone does want to make that kind of money and that, get that recognition. But our goal was a little different. It was really just to dig into the work and do the work. Very interesting. So you spent time in New York. How did you get to LA from New York? Um, it's really funny. I, I don't think I ever would have uh, come to LA. I, I was a New York person. I liked New York. Um, but little by little, I, I kept getting jobs in LA. I, I did a commercial out here. I'm, I'm in LA now. And then I went back to New York. And then I did a, a, a pilot with James Garner. I don't know if you remember James Garner. Rockford Very well. Files and Absolutely. all that. And I did that. And so that came out to shoot the pilot. And then that show got picked up. And that's what made me make the move. And that was in 92 to move out here to do the pilot with James Garner. Very cool, very cool. So I know, I know you have a history of working with Whit Stillman. How did that come about? That's a, um, also, a, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, Whit is really one of my good friends. He and I have been friends for 30 years. Metropolitan, the first movie he did and I did with him, we just had our 30th anniversary uh, and there was a big screening up in San Francisco for it, stuff like that. Um, I was taking acting class in, in New York City. And uh, I was uh, doing a play where I played kind of a preppy guy in the play in, in this acting class. Sure. And there was an advertisement in Backstage, which is the actor's newspaper where they have stories about actors. And, and then they also list auditions. And there was an audition for this movie. Uh, and so I... I left acting class a little early, kind of dressed as a preppy. I was wearing a sport coat and a tie and glasses. And uh, I went to this audition. And there were probably 500 people there. Uh, and we kind of went in in groups of 10. And Wit just sort of talked to us to kind of get a feel of who we were. And based on that, he, he called me back to read for the part. And then I got the part. No, good for you. Yeah, I, I am a... Uh... I'm definitely a fan of Witt's films. Uh, and th there, there's a really good combination of uh, like Chris Eichemann, one of your fellow actors in Metropolitan. He has this wonderful, or his character has a wonderful acerbic sense of humor. Oh, absolutely. And, and there, it, it's just, I, I find the films to be just a really good ensemble uh, of people that just bring a lot of different things to the table. Yeah, well, Wynn has such a unique voice. And I think that's what people resonate toward. They just, they just he, has, he has a unique voice, and so. Very, very cool, very cool. Um, so after Metropolitan, then uh, I know Barcelona was one of the other films. Right, I've done uh, three or four movies with Wynn, maybe even five. Um, Metropolitan Barcelona, Lat four, Last Days of Disco, and Damsels in Distress. I did very small parts in those other movies. Yeah. But, uh, uh, it's been a, a pleasure to be friends with Wood and to work with him. Yeah. Well, I know, I know one of the silver linings out of Barcelona was uh, that that's where you met your wife. That's right. Yeah, we were shooting in, in Barcelona, Spain. And we were there for, you know, three and a half, four months. And uh, I, I met Marga. Um, about halfway through the shoot and we just started hanging out and uh you know she she spoke english because my spanish is still not very good which is really awful because i know you you speak spanish uh but uh we just started hanging out and the rest is history was she in the film or was she watching the filming no she was friends of um one of the men who did sound on the film and okay. he had a little dinner party one night and he invited some of his English speaking Spanish friends over and Marga came to that. And then, then Marga did end up doing like a little extra bit in a, one of the party scenes, but uh, no, she's not in the film. Good, good stuff. So, so fast forward to around 2000, there was uh, an HBO series called Mind of the Married Man, which if I'm recalling correctly, was on for two seasons. Correct, yep. You, you've done your research, Bob. I, I, I do my best. I do my best. And, and, and I'm a legend in my own mind. There you go. So, so tell me about that experience. Uh, that, that was a, a really different uh, group of people. 
You know, that was um, Mike Binder created that show and uh, starred in it. And I had just done a movie with Mike called Sex Monster and a uh, very funny uh, movie. And uh, so kind of based on that relationship, uh, I, I did Mind of the Married Man. And, you know, it was such a, uh, a fun show. Um, we were never satisfied. Mike was never satisfied. The actors were never satisfied. We always thought we could do one more take and make it funnier, make it better, make it more outlandish, more personal, more unique, uh, more meaningful. And um, it was just a great, Kate, Kate Walsh played my wife and she's wonderful. And uh, Sonia Walger and Jake, Jake, um, <laughs> Jake, who's in Weber. Jake Weber, thank you. And uh, it was just, a, it was a great, experience and i'm so sorry it, it got it, it ended because uh i think we could have told a ton of stories you know the mind of the married man is a very fertile place i it, it reminds me of the the male version of sex in the city yeah you know i i actually think that was one of the problems with the show is is we did come on right after sex in the city and people were expecting it to be the male sex in the city and it really wasn't it was really a uh a different kind of show. Uh, and so I think that we had trouble getting out from underneath the umbrella of Sex and the City. Yeah. Because Sex and the City was, was such a wonderful show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I also think that, uh, you know, the language in Mind of the Married Man and, and some of the scenes are pretty racy. And, and I, I think to a certain degree, there's a double standard in terms of, you know, what, what flies for, for the women is okay. I'm, I'm not so sure people see a male cast or, or, or something that's a male or oriented perspective as, as being okay. No, I think you're totally right. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's one thing, you know, to have women sort of speaking that way and kind of, you know, getting into the nitty gritty. And it's another thing to hear men do it, partly because we've heard men do it for, you know, decades. Yeah. And we're kind of tired of it. Yeah. Also, the, the, the show premiered on September 11th, 2001. Oh and people just weren't in the mood to see a show about a guy who wanted to cheat on his beautiful wife when the World Trade Centers were coming down. So I think timing was a little bit of a problem with the show also. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, people... I remember that period vividly, and, and, and I know people were just trying to hang on and process what had happened, right? Yeah. And, and you're, you're looking for goodness in the world, and, and the, the main character's role that certainly didn't have a lot of goodness in it. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, one of the last movies you were in was Chappaquiddick, um, and you played Ted, so Ted Sorensen, who was Ted Kennedy's advisor. Yeah, speechwriter advisor, right? Speechwriter, that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, that Everyone was, says that he wrote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Oh, did he really? I, I didn't know that. That's sort of the, the, the saying, but. I, I didn't realize he had that history with the Kennedy family. Yeah. Um, but that was, that was just a really powerful film. And I seem to recall that Ted Kennedy, Ted Kennedy's persona was projected onto the American people where Chappaquiddick showed you the darker side and I, I would suspect a much more real aspect of who Ted Kennedy was and what happened in, uh, in Chappaquiddick where right. uh, Marianne Kopechny drowned in her car and he was driving drunk right. and uh, ultimately was covered up. Right, Mary, Mary Jo Kopechny. Um, Very good. Thank you. Uh, John Kieran directed that. And, um, you know, he's such a wonderful director and such a great guy. Uh, and he, he it's, it, you know, this is interesting because he, he talked to me first about playing Paul Markham, which was Kennedy's advisor and the DA for Massachusetts, the role that, uh, that uh, uh, finally went to Jim, Jim Gaffigan. And, um, uh, John was really great. He said, you know, I, I just, you know, Jim Gaffigan's a huge star and really talented. And, and so 
but John, the director, spoke to me and said, you know, I, I, I really liked meeting you, and I, I, I hope you'll, you'll take this other role of Ted, Ted Sorensen, and uh, I think you can bring a lot to that, and, and um, you know, that's just, just one of those things about the business, you know, and, and there's all kinds of reasons why you get parts and don't get parts, and, you know, and, and so I was really happy to, to be in the movie and to play Ted, Ted Sorensen. Um, uh, and I, I think Jason Clark did such a great job with Ted Kennedy. It was, it was a, it was a soulful film while still being funny. There were some funny parts in it, you know? Um, and yet we saw, I thought, a very well-rounded portrait of Kennedy and the people that were around him. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I was, I was just really engaged and, and uh, maybe not quite on the end, edge of my seat, but I, I was just fully engaged in, in the film. I, I just found it to be really, really interesting. Well, so much of it was about the cover-up, about how, how are yeah, we going to handle yeah. the, the media. And, you know, what's really amazing is everyone forgets this, but it happened the same weekend as the moon landing. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. Well, yeah. that would explain why a whole lot of it didn't hit the press, right? Because everyone's attention was on the moon landing. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, also we were in uh, a completely different news cycle environment. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about if we can keep this story out of the news until five o'clock, then no one will know about it because everyone turns their story in at five o'clock. The evening news is on at five o'clock or whatever. And then there's a new cycle and it might get buried over the weekend. Yeah, I mean, it was such a completely different time in terms of uh, how, you, how you receive news. I mean, right now you've got this continuous flow of, uh, of news on the internet, on cable channels. And you know, that, that was the, you, you tune in at five o'clock or six o'clock for the evening news with Walter Cronkite or David Brinkley, or, or you looked at the newspaper in the afternoon and that had everything that had happened yeah. uh, a few yeah. hours earlier in the day. I, I don't know if you remember, but when we were growing up, we, because I was a paper boy, um, we would get the Detroit Free Press in the morning and the Lansing State Journal in the afternoon. And I, I learned, that I, and I didn't know this either, that a lot of newspapers used to publish twice a day. They would publish in the morning and in the afternoon. And, you know, that's where people got their news. Yeah. So you had to publish again, you know. As close to real-time coverage as you could get at the time. Yeah, yeah. And now it's all right here whenever we want it, you know. Uh, it, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so now you're involved in a, in a couple projects. You, you're involved in Pen15, uh, Perry Mason. And then you've got the sleeper horror picture, uh, one BR that that seems to be catching fire. Yeah, you know it's um, it's really funny uh, because you never know what projects are gonna click or hit or whatever, and you could spend months working on a movie and no one sees it, and you can spend a day shooting a commercial. And you know, your fifth grade teacher calls you up and says, Taylor, I saw you in that commercial or something like that. Um, one BR was, uh, it's not a really a horror film. It's more like a psychological thriller okay. um, made by David Marmer. And um, they shot the movie for nothing. We, we got paid nothing. I think I worked 18 days on it and we shot over the holidays. I remember my wife, Marga, was, was kind of upset that I'm leaving the holidays. I, I have two daughters, one both in college now, but at the time only one was in college. And they were home and here I am leaving every morning at 5.30 in the morning to go shoot this low budget psycho thriller, you know, for a hundred dollars a day. And uh, she's like, come on, you know, stay home, you know, be with us. And uh, so I'm really glad that the movie has found a life. It's, it's paid off. It's, a, it's quite a good movie. It's, it's all about cults and uh, cults in LA especially. So Yeah, yeah. well, I, I guess it just goes to show what a terrible human being you are, abandoning your family <laughs> during the holidays, right? Right, and I'm a bad guy in the movie. 
Well, well, there you go. There you go. You get a double, uh, a double whammy, or perhaps uh, you know, do double the value. Um, if you had, if you had advice for someone getting into film right now, which is, I think, such a different business climate than when we've had in the past, what what would your advice be? Um, great question. You know, we were talking earlier about the series I did with James Garner. That's the series that brought me out to LA. There was an actor who's a little bit older than me. George, George Weiner was on the show. Um, your, your audience would recognize him if they saw him, but he's, he's not necessarily a household name. Um, but he's really funny and he's just a great actor and a great guy. And we, you know, there's a lot of downtime on a set. And so I remember one day, uh, I was brand new in LA and so excited and, and uh, George and I were talking and George said, oh, you just missed it. You just missed it. This was like 1991, 92. Uh, and he said, you know, the 70s and the 80s, that was, that was the golden era of Los Angeles film, TV. You just missed it. And I feel like I would say to a person who's just starting off, oh, you just missed it. You know, the 90s and the 2000s and stuff were a great era for film and TV. Um, but the truth is, no one missed it. And when we went into my era, we started to go into the internet and indie films. And when we're going into the next generation's era, we're going into Instagram and TikTok and, and YouTube shows. And now anybody can do anything and put it out to the world anywhere, on any platform, on YouTube, on Instagram, on whatever. And so my advice to them would be, don't sit around and wait for your agent to call or wait for someone to give you a job in their project. Make your own damn project and put it out to the world. Sarah Cooper is a perfect example. She's the woman who oh, she's wonderful. Um, lip, lip syncs Trump and uh, put it out there. Yeah. You don't know where it's gonna land and it might open a door to Hollywood or you might just keep doing your own thing like John, John Cassavetes used to do and stuff like that. So that, that's my advice is, is use the tools that are available today to tell the stories that you wanna tell. Don't wait around to be a part of someone else's story. Yeah, well, and, and that's what we're doing here, right? I mean, this, this is going out on YouTube uh, and, and, and the really enlightened people are going to watch this. I, I Absolutely. Uh, so tell your friends and family about the show. I totally um, will. There, there you go. Um, if, you, if there's something that you have not accomplished in life or in your career to this point, what would it be? Oh, I know exactly. Um, direct a feature film, full, full stop. I've, I've, I've directed a lot of theater. I've directed two short films, one that got a lot of attention and won some awards and was bought and actually made a little bit of money, which for a short film is very rare. Um, but I, 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 I need to direct a feature and uh, I'm glad you asked that because I need to put that out there so that it comes back because, yeah. you know, if you don't ask for stuff in life, it, yeah. it don't come. Yeah, yeah. So, so for all you folks in, uh, in, in positions of control in the entertainment arena, th this man needs to direct your next film. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely, uh, Bob. Really I wonderful to talk the, the conversation. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. The next episode, I'm going to speak with three-time Olympian at 1500 meters in track and field, Shannon Roberry. So stay tuned, that should be a great conversation. And uh, we'll see you next time.